Hi, uh, I'm Kyle. Uh, I work for the uh, Bottle Rocket Project at, at AWS, and I'm going to talk to you a little about writing in open source, not necessarily writing code, but human communication uh, in the written form. So basically what I'm going to go over is the background and context of this presentation, some overarching ideas, and then we'll do kind of the practical lessons learned, and that'll be kind of interactive, so I'll probably be asking you to kind of raise your hands or say something uh, towards the end of the presentation. So just before we begin, um, I will tell you a little bit that uh, writing and people are always works in progress. I say that because you might look at some of the things that I've done or some of the words that I say and you say, well, that's not exactly what you are espousing here in this presentation, and that's okay. We're all developing and we're all trying to trend towards that you know, ideal that you want to get to. Um, and I think that is especially... Uh, pertinent in writing, especially when we're doing things in open source where we can always make changes. Um, so I do want to get that out of the way, but um, my personal history in this, I've been writing software as long as I can remember. There's photos of me as a tiny kid, like in front of a computer, and then I started writing software at some point as a kid, and I've been doing it ever since. Uh, how I got involved in kind of this part of technology is interesting. Uh, about 15 years ago, I started writing blog posts. Uh, because when I didn't understand something and I couldn't find anybody else that had written about it, I wrote something about it. Uh, eventually, I started writing everything that I figured out, and a particular piece of software said, that's really great, we'd like to, to give you money for this, and I said, that's a thing? Really, you can, someone will pay you to write about stuff? And so that kind of put me on this road to getting me to be a developer advocate. So um, with that, I now work for the Bottle Rocket Project, uh, which is a container-optimized Linux distribution, um, so if you want to run something for Kubernetes, you can use that in your worker nodes. I won't get into it, but you can see our nice logo on the side here. Um, but where this project and this narrative starts is on the previous project that I worked on. Uh, so I've worked at AUS for a number of years, and I worked on the Open Search project, and their booth is out there. You should go out and talk to them. They're great people. Chris is out there and his friends. Um, and I was there when it started, and Open Search was kind of interesting because it was born out of kind of a continuation, a fork of another project. Uh, to keep it open source, and um, it was really interesting because that was when it was like at the center of some tech news, and so kind of the open search project and what what became that was uh, something that everybody was writing about for a number of weeks, and um, my role in that project really was to kind of talk about what was happening because at that, that point it hadn't become a fully licensed open source project. It was something that was an idea. Um, and I got feedback about how we were writing about it. Now, we had always had the intent to make it open source. And then I had people come to me and say, we really don't like the way you're talking about this open source project. And I had to do some kind of self-evaluation and understand why. I think the intentions were great. Um, but then on top of that, what we've done is taken what I learned in the open search project, and now I work on the bottle rocket project. And we've applied that in a more systematic way. Um, so I want to kind of tell you my experiences about that and kind of some of my opinions on it. Uh, hopefully, you can use them to help you write better in open source and write in a way that's more inclusive. So let's talk a little bit about open source and what it means as far as writing. Now, if you were to create a magical weighing machine and took all the effort that you would have in any given open source project, you might be surprised by what time is spent on. My intention is to say that time is actually spent more on like writing and communicating with other humans than it is actually on source code. Um, and when you think of this, you think about documentation, but that is the tip of the iceberg. You have things like uh, pull request or merge request where you're describing something. You have things like issues where a user is describing something they found or maybe a security issue. You have code uh, comments, which are in the source code, but they're human communication that's written, not logic. Um, so that's something that takes a lot of time, and good projects have lots of code comments. Uh, policies have to be written, and those take an inordinate amount of time to get right, and a lot of communication back and forth. You have things like your project site where you're talking about things in the project. Um, you have things like uh, blog posts, which take a lot of time um, to also put together where you're describing maybe uses of things. You have things like talks where you have to write abstracts like I did for this or the talk itself. Uh, you have release notes where everybody is... Uh, every time you release software, you're describing what's in that, and then you have things like design documents that take a huge amount of time to describe how you, the technical direction of things. If you take like all of these, and this is not even there's much more, you're going to start realizing that the source code is that's 
considerable amount of time, but there is also a huge amount of time that goes into the written communication. So with that, you have to consider what's going on with that. Um, functionally, writing in open source is uh, different. Um, marketing copy will not fly in open source. So if you've ever looked at something, you go, wow, that doesn't look like it makes sense. Uh, it, a lot of times, it's something that they've taken and like, took some marketing copy and tried to use it in an open source project, and it just looks wrong. And the reason is the goals are different, right? Marketing copy is generally there to sell you something or to uh, get you to do something uh, that involves some sort of exchange. Uh, open source doesn't have that. I mean, the goals in open source might be to get a contributor. That's not selling something to somebody. Uh, the relationship is different as well. Like you, the way you find out about open source projects you care about might be a dependency. You never even actively chose that, right? So you, when people are talking about this, you have to describe it in that way. Um, and then it's not the same as writing for internal writing either. So stuff that you might find between inside your company, uh, that's a very different way of writing too, because functionally there, what you're doing is you're writing to a known audience with a known kind of structure, and you won't be able to do like a pull request on a company policy very often. Maybe in some very radically open companies you might, too, might be able to, but that might not be a very welcome thing uh, to uh, do a pull request on some sort of uh, company policy. So it's very different. And even when you talk about software itself, services are a different way of writing as well. So when you have software uh, as a service, which I work for Amazon Web Services, um, and that's services in the name, there's a different kind of structure that exists. Uh, there is an understood clear relationship in services between the people who are using the software and those who are providing it. And that breaks down when you start bringing in open source projects into the mix. It's very different. So in effect, what I'm saying is um, you have to kind of look at these things in a way that uh, are showing how different they are. Um, even with you know, software as a service, the specificity of use is something that is implied. You may have terms of service that limit that. In open source software, we want people to use things in crazy ways. Like There is no kind of like, you have to use this for one particular use. So when we take this all into effect, we have this like different type of writing that might be foreign for a lot of different teams. Um, and so you have to kind of find the right way of doing that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some overarching ideas about um, writing in open source software. Um, these are ideas that have come to my front view by looking at the different pieces that I've worked with in the past, um, and it comes down to a few different things. The first part I want to talk about is uh, voice. Um, what is voice? I like this definition. It's a rhetorical mix of vocabulary, tone, tone, point of view, and syntax that makes phrases, sentences, and paragraphs flow in a particular manner. If you've ever read something written by someone you know and you hear their voice in your head, like that is a very strong voice that they have. But it can mean other things as well. Projects can have voices. Um, so for example, you have a consistent way of writing about a project that might have some descriptors to it. So in the Bottle Rocket project, we try to write very matter-of-factly and empowering. But I've worked in other projects that have a very narrative way of speaking about things. And they have almost a rebellious tone. If I was to move those around between different projects, it would sound off. It wouldn't sound right. So not only does a project have that, the individual has their own voice as well. And this gets tricky when you're collaborating, right? If you have a very strong individual voice, and you try to collaborate on a document, it's going to sound disjointed when other people try to bring in new paragraphs that are not in that voice. So you have to kind of figure out the right way to balance those pieces. So in named writing, for example, like a blog post that said written by Kyle Davis, Kyle Davis's voice is going to come first, but the project voice still has to exist. If you're talking about documentation or like release notes, it shouldn't like sound like it's coming from Kyle. It shouldn't sound like it's coming from the project. The other thing I want to talk a little bit about is style guides. Um, incredibly important, but don't write your own style guide. It is probably the biggest mistake that you can make. These are really time consuming to write well, and you should find somebody that is something similar. So uh, Bottle Rocket uses the OpenStack style guide, right? We are not in any way related to OpenStack or the OpenStack you know, family of products or projects, but it's familiar enough to us um, that we can really use it. And the other thing to look at is that you shouldn't really try to adopt something from an associated organization or feel that pressure. Like you might say, okay, well, uh, 
This project came out of AWS, so we're gonna use the AWS style guide, right? That might work, but it might not because you have different goals. And that's why we ended up with like something totally different. Um, and you have to look at that. So like, for example, when we were talking about Bottle Rocket using this OpenStack style guide, that works because they're kind of similar projects. If I was to try to use like the WordPress or like the Blender style guide, it probably wouldn't work because we're talking about containers and infrastructure and things like that, and they wouldn't have the right kind of metaphors and tools in those style guides. Um, you're gonna have things when you adopt another style guide, which are your exceptions to those style guides, so the complexity of those style guide exceptions, something you have to consider. So if you have a big long list of exceptions, we use the OpenStack style guide except for these 25 points, uh, is it the right thing to do to have 25 exceptions on it, or should you find something that matches a little bit better? Um, and this is the, my, my favorite one for, for style guides is, don't expect anybody to read it, right, at first. This is the, at first, is where I really put a lot of weight on it, because what's gonna happen is, you're gonna have people write something, somebody's gonna review it, maybe it's you, maybe it's someone else, and then you're gonna say, this doesn't match our style guide, and they're gonna say, what is that, right? And, and then the next piece, they're gonna actually have internalized that style guide, and then they'll have a lot more um, workable first copies. So, a lot of great stuff on this. Now, where we get into another piece that I think ties into the style guide in an interesting way um, is naming terms and inclusion. This is something that I've had to deal with in a couple different ways. It is really complicated to navigate. Um, what you should be doing on this is finding the correct concrete guidepost to help you navigate this particular issue. And when I say naming terms and inclusion, um, there are a number of terms that maybe don't work out um, in the public context, or maybe they're outdated, or things we've decided to move on from language. Um, one place that I look to is inclusivenaming.org. Uh, really great project where they have come up with word lists and term lists based on different categories. You can help find and navigate your project that way. Um, there'll be other places as well. For example, your code of conduct will have potentially words that you do or don't use in your project that helps you uh, be a more inclusive community. And there'll be other places as well. Sometimes, you know, uh, linters out there for this type of writing do have these names included in them. When looking at terms and inclusion, one thing you really have to do is look at how they work with your corner cases in your community. So, for example, um, sometimes you'll have a dependency that has a very different point of view on these uh, terms, and you have to figure out bef uh, beforehand where you're kind of kind of interact with those. How do you describe a term that they use regularly? and you can't really use because it's something you've decided that's not healthy for your project. The other thing to remember here is that we live in a global world. I presented this in Portland in the US, I'm from Canada, and now I'm in Germany presenting this, and every different culture is gonna bring its own baggage to the, to the plate here, and they're gonna have different uh, standards for it. A lot of this is about education and being maximally inclusive in your community. Um, and sometimes people don't understand that in a different context, you may be excluding people. So it's a really important part of this is to understand how to navigate the different global contexts that are here. Um, and there's sometimes a lot of tricky conversations that have to happen around this. All right, so feedback. This is a really tricky part about writing because a lot of times in open source projects, you're accepting written communication as pull requests or in some other type of other uh, contribution. Uh, and if you have set up your project well, hopefully you can make this a very neutral way of providing feedback to those users. If you don't, it can really be looking like Kyle doesn't like your writing. Uh, and that is not a place you want to be. Where you want to have is those concrete guide posts, either from your style guide, from your naming and inclusion guides, that help you take the uh, Kyle doesn't like this or whomever's reviewing it doesn't like it and put it into something else. The great thing that we have here is that uh, a lot of what we're doing is actually um, things that are uh, like linting, right? Like we're pretty used to getting things from uh, linters and getting that feedback automated ways, and that is pretty useful uh, that a lot of people in our communities are already used to that. And be crystal clear on who's saying what. Um, this can be something that can be tricky uh, because, you know, if you are providing that feedback, you need to make sure that it's the feedback that 
uh, between what you are saying, maybe you're providing some guidance on it, um, but also there's things that are in the style guide that may be non-negotiable. Okay. Um, I want to do in this section some practical lessons learned, and I'm going to read to you a few different cases that we've seen in our community. Um, these are individual sentences, and then what I'll have you do at the end of these three kind of phrases, maybe you can tell me if you know what the problem is with these sentences. So, practical lessons learned. Here's an example. We are excited to announce the release of 1.0.0 in a blog post. Okay, that's the first one. The release of 1.4.0 has been delayed. We are decided to focus on something else on the project site. Um, thank you for your contribution. We will review it and get back to you. Does anybody know what the common, maybe problem point between those three statements are? Anybody? Who is we? Who is we? That's great. So um, we is a really dangerous little word in the English language related us and our. It's a plural first person collective pronoun. Um, ha, you're coming to a talk about grammar. You didn't know that. Um, but we is particularly problematic in English because there is like six different ways you can use it. I'm not going to go through them because they require a lot of examples. Uh, but at the heart, they are ambiguous for the most part. So when you have we in it, it's really hard to parse out who it means, right? Um, is it clear who you're speaking for? Are you speaking for uh, the whole community? Maybe that could be pretty problematic. Um, is, are you speaking for uh, maintainers or yourself and you're using the royal we? Um, it's not very clear very often and you have to put yourself in the seat of the reader sometimes to understand where it's coming from. So how do the alternatives work here? Speak for yourself. Sometimes that's very difficult for people to do. Saying I believe something is so much harder than saying we believe something for whatever reason. Uh, but encourage people to speak for themselves in all contexts where they're doing that because they don't want to speak for the entire community. Um, and then define your antecedent. Uh, if you're not careful, defining an antecedent can sound like you are doing like a policy. We, the maintainers of Bottle Rocket, believe dot, dot, dot. But there's a lot trickier ways of doing that where you're actually making it very abundantly clear to the reader what it means. Um, but you should have that kind of litmus test to read through and say, have I defined what this means? So, next set of three. Ball and Rocket believes that security comes first. Uh, issue 467 suggests a memory leak on an issue. Uh, Ball and Rocket says to Kubernetes, uh, I'm ready in documentation. Can anybody identify the problem with those three statements? Okay, go ahead. Is it the whole project? That's a good part of it. There is one thing that overarches all of this, and that's Anthropomorphism. Um, this is something when I was in my master's degree that my master's advisor would say, don't ever do this. But you're assigning human traits to non-human objects. If we take a look back at that, now just go back a couple slides. Uh, Ball or Rocket can't believe anything. It has no brain. It is a collective of people. Uh, and uh, you know, issue, issues can't suggest anything. People in issues can suggest something. And uh, Kubernetes, a bottle rocket says to Kubernetes, I'm ready, right? Is the bottle rocket project talking to the Kubernetes project or is a bottle rocket node talking to a Kubernetes control plane? It becomes very complicated. Um, one of the things that you can often see here is when projects and uh, companies have the same name, it becomes super unclear when you start anthropomorphizing. Um, so it's a really tricky thing. There was a blog post that came out a few weeks ago. I'm not going to name names, which projects that were involved in. But it became a big deal because they were anthropomorphizing the project. And it became very contentious very quickly um, because there was that overlap. Oftentimes, this masks technical details in ways that you don't want to do. Uh, the bottle rocket says to Kubernetes, um, you know, that, that's not being very clear to your users. And then People can confuse what you're meaning with that. Um, and then, how do you fix this? Uh, point to a person, then a thing. The example with the issue. The issue isn't saying thing. The person is saying something. And be more precise in your details, however that might come about, right? So it can be, uh, if you're meaning projects, you may have to say the Bottle Rocket project um, has a document that says X, Y, and Z. OK. Another set of three, and then we'll wrap up. 
Uh, supported characters are digits 0 through 9 and A through Z in the documentation. The following versions are no longer supported, and the following vendors provide support. Can anybody identify what's going on in those three statements? No. Okay, okay go ahead. She said, those are three definitions, different definitions of support. Yes. Uh, that is what we call an overloaded term. Um, this is incredibly common. Uh, one term has multiple meanings based on the context. This came from one document where we had support meaning seven different things in a matter of three paragraphs, uh, and it can be really, really hard to understand. Um, there can be other terms, too. I'm not just picking on support. Uh, that's something for our particular context in, in open source projects you should really think about. So. Uh, what does it mean for your particular context? Uh, this has an incredible effect on those who have a high degree of fluency in the language that it's there. Um, as people who are highly fluent in English, you might easily parse out what support means in any given context, but someone who has been speaking English for a much shorter amount of time might have a higher difficulty there. So you're really kind of excluding people uh, inadvertently by using these terms very loosely. Uh, this often only reveals itself in context on one page. If you have, let's say, a project site and it says support once, you can probably quickly parse that out. But on multiple pages, it can be very complicated. So how you fix this? A great exercise to do when you start identifying these terms is to try to find replacement terms that work in a variety of grammatical contexts and then sub them in. Uh, it can be really tricky. You'll start to realize how hard writing can be when you're trying to write for people of varying different fluency in English uh, or whatever language you're, you're targeting. Um, so actively pick those terms that might fit, fit it a little bit better. It was a real challenge for us to kind of unwind what the word support meant in our project. Okay, so to wrap up, there are four things I want you to take away. Style and content are not portable. So you can't just take content from one place, copy and paste it into another place, especially in open source. It's not gonna work very well. You're probably gonna end up confusing people along the way. Um, you have to relentlessly pursue clarity. Every time something is written, you need to make sure and ask yourself, is this clear from a variety of contexts? You have to actively disambiguate constantly in uh, your writing. So it may seem a little unnatural to define antecedents. It may seem a little unnatural to define what you mean by the maintainers of your project versus the overall contributors. Um, but it is important to making sure it is accessible to everybody and then have guidance over guiding as an individual. That will give you those concrete guideposts to help anybody contribute to your project uh, for written communication in a meaningful way instead of it being you know, the Kyle show or the whatever show of movers doing this and, and providing uh, you know, the editing for these pieces of content in your, in your project. Okay, so I think we're ready for Q&A. Anybody have questions? I have a question about when do you use... Um, so when you're speaking on behalf of a project, mm -hmm. um, I have chosen to do that before for not being a target specific. Okay. Um, that's why... Could you clarify a little bit more? On how would you put yourself as an individual without becoming a target and people thinking it's your particular decision? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, when you're trying to speak for yourself as... as you're in an individual project, but you don't want to be the target for maybe somebody who doesn't want to have really um, positive outcomes out of this, it can be tricky. Um, from my perspective, sufficiently um, putting that, you know, I'm speaking for myself, and uh, this is my personal belief on something. Others may also believe something else. And I, I think that one of the earlier presentations did a great way of doing it. I think Ruth talked about like, I'm three out of 10 on this particular opinion, giving like you know, how strongly you believe in something uh, and leaving room for others to have other opinions. Um, that way you're not just making it, um, you're the person who's the mouthpiece for something and then all the ire for that goes directly to you. You've left an opening. That's my point of view. I've come into it a few times. Um, it's tricky though, and it's, more contextual than probably we'd like it to be. Other questions? Yep. Yeah. 
You talked about writing that is globally inclusive so mm -hmm. that you don't exclude particular people. Can you give us an example to illustrate that? Yeah. Um, the support example is a great person, a great example of this. We had a person in our community that read through the document and came away with how we were using support indicating that we were providing support in an open source project when we were talking about the support of um, a particular um, version, right? Um, so they thought if I was using the current version, then I could contact somebody about that, even though the license said it was as is. Um, so what it really made us do is step back and say, that person who came from Japan um, had a different understanding of what the word support meant and kind of, you know, they, they went over the line for what it meant. So we really had to kind of go back and say, okay, how does this look if we were to really be um, more precise with our language, right? Um, I think it was reasonable to think if you looked at the word support in paragraph one and support par in paragraph four, it confused people. Um, so with that, I think it's, it's making sure that you're using not... Uh, language that is lowest common denominator, but using language that's precise, that would have a hard time being misunderstood. Um, I think that's where you kind of like become more globally inclusive, right? If you're just talking to a bunch of people who have spoke English for 30 years, people are going to get more out of context. I have a quick question, I hope. So when you talk about being precise with words and support is a great example um that works for one project but our users and members are exposed to so many projects defining their own terms yeah so how do we deal with that yeah that's tricky um we do have a glossary in our project um that says this is what we mean by very various different terms in the project one of the things that is unique about bottle rocket is we name things after dog breeds so we have uh, things called Sheltie, and um, you know, there's one we're talking about right now is Pug, and you know, all sorts of different things like that. And that can be really weird when you don't know what that means, and it might have different meanings other places. Um, and if you provide sufficient links to those pieces, it makes it a little easy to kind of unlock what that meaning is. Um, sometimes it is just maybe overlinking those things in, in the pieces that you're talking about. Because if someone's coming into it, the, we've all heard the example of kind of techno babble where people have these really strange words that me, have zero meaning outside of that uh, context. So got to provide that kind of context over the top because you got to remember somebody can come in at any given point and they could be confusing what pug means in a different uh, project. So the glossary is where I kind of unlock that. Sort of the easy way to react is to make things longer, to explain, to add sentences. I love parentheses. My writing has too many parentheticals. How do you do that without um, exploding and expecting people to read treatises about what you're saying? Yeah, that's that can be. It can make things really long sometimes. Other times, you can kind of provide asides to it. Either we actually extensively use footnotes in our documentation and some of the pieces that we write. Um, to kind of give people that I don't understand this uh, way to kind of get the escape hatch. It can mean linking as well. Um, those are kind of free from a linguistic standpoint that it can make it flow very nicely. But if you have something, you know, even parenthetically, more information on this project, it will give people a place to go for it. Um, so that I, I would rather err on the side of being a little bit more uh, descriptive, so if anybody comes in, they, they see it. But when you want to keep it smaller, uh, try to provide linking, and then providing feedback on that is also great too, because somebody who does the like, majority of writing for a project, um, it's easy for you to do, but when you're talking about somebody who's writing something new, you can say, what does this mean? Can you link this? Um, that provides a lot of places for it to be a more um, instantly understandable document. All right, thanks. That was it. Thank you very much, Kyle. Connect with me.